Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. 18-year-old Liam says, I always had a happy life. I never had a sad life before, but sometimes I get confused. I struggle a little bit. At an early age, Liam was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. His sister, photographer Erin Lefebvre, gives us a glimpse into his daily life and what being on the autism spectrum means in a remarkable photo essay called Liam's World. What it reveals is relevant, given that more than 3.5 million Americans live with autism. And according to the Centers for Disease Control, it is believed to affect one in 59 births in the United States. Erin Lefebvre is joining us today to discuss what she has learned about autism through chronicling the daily life of her brother. And Barbara Bookman, University Director of Disability Programs and Project REACH at the City University, will tell us how that project is working to fulfill the university's mission of providing an affordable and accessible higher education to students who are on the autism spectrum or who have other disabilities. Welcome. One hears so much about um, autism these days. I know neither of you are physicians, but what is it? Is it a disease, is it a neurological disorder, uh, a behavioral disorder? How can we classify it? Would you like to? Okay. Well, autism is interesting. It can be, it has been described as a neurological disorder. It has been described as a disability. But basically, it's really a range of conditions. It's a brain wiring difference that affects somebody's social skills. It will affect perhaps how somebody perceives um, and has so perceives the world and has socialization. Um, people on the autism spectrum can have repetitive movements. It's very unique to each person, but it's really in the category we call of neurodiversity. Okay, do we know what causes it? Do we know? Or is that sort of a mystery? We really don't. We know that one thing that doesn't cause it, and there was a scare about vaccines, and we know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. We really don't know. And as far as the statistics, one in 59 is what we're seeing. We've also heard as low as one in 40, and we hear one in 69, depending on uh, really how it is being diagnosed. Yeah. It, it's changing. There are more people being diagnosed. There's more awareness and earlier diagnosis is happening right now. When I was growing up, uh, I, I remember a lot of people referred to some young people or older people as retarded. That was the word you, you heard. Now you never hear the, the word retarded. That word is banned. Uh, it's <laughs> um, but is that because the people we used to call retarded are really artistic or are they two different things? They are definitely two uh, different diagnoses. So I think with retardation that would refer more to intellectual disabilities and there is si kind of some confusion as to autism can or at least formerly was mistaken as intellectual disabilities but they are two different diagnoses. So autism, just to sort of echo what Barbara has said, is more, does impact a person's social skills, so not always their intellect, so right. they are two different. Right. Erin, you said you started taking pictures of your brother Liam, who is now 18, because you wanted to understand um, how he sees the world and get a better sense of who he is as he transitions from, transition from youth to adulthood. Uh, when did you start f photographing him, and what have you learned about him? I began photographing my brother in 2014. I had just completed my second semester at the San Francisco Art Institute, and that's where I began to study documentary photography. So I was back home in New York City on a summer break and photographing my brother and spending a lot of time with him. And this was an idea that I had. Uh, for me, photography is a way to better understand the world and connect with individuals and communities I might not otherwise have access to, but obviously this is my younger brother, so I saw photography as a medium for being able to connect with him on a deeper level. So I just would bring my camera along and photograph his day-to-day -day life just to kind of put it into a different perspective. And it also helped me to look at him a bit more objectively. And it really did help me to under, better understand who he is as a person. It sort of gives me a better idea into his insight 
Initially, I was just using the singular photographs of him in his day to day, but as time progressed, that's when I decided to incorporate the handwriting. So I just began to show my brother different sets of images from what I would photographed and we would discuss them like I would ask him how are you do you remember how you felt in this moment or what does this photograph does it evoke any memories for you and we would just kind of talk about it I would ask him to elaborate a little bit more and then I would have him uh, write down his thoughts and feelings onto each image um, so did you learn things about your brother that surprised you he, I feel like I learned more so about his personality and sort of how he interprets situations and the world around him. For people with autism, it's not always easy to express those thoughts and especially when it comes to socializing with other people. So I got to see the dynamics, for example, of how he interacts with his friends and his classmates. And he goes to a special needs school in New Rochelle, so a lot of the students there are also on the autism spectrum. Uh, some have intellectual disabilities as well. So it, you know, watching his interactions and being able to photograph that uh, sort of as a witness there, it really helped me to better understand, you know, how people who do have uh, autism and disabilities interact with one another. And just, it's been really interesting to photograph my brother, you know, from 14 to 18. Those are very crucial years right. in development and growth. So it's really nice to kind of see how he's gone from teenager into adulthood. Now, is this a boarding school or is he is this a day school and he lives at home? Yeah, it's a day school. So he just goes to New Rochelle from morning till the early afternoon. He has a school bus that comes and picks him up and drops him off back home. How long will he be able to continue in that school? The school runs, it's sort of like a high school into, I would say, sort of an extension of college. So the students are there until they're 21. And the school, in addition to giving them their educational curriculum, they also teach them um, job skills, you know, career skills. So they'll have classes throughout the day, uh, gym, art, social studies, English, et cetera. Um, they also have an empathy class as well, since empathy is sort of um, difficult for people with autism. They're not able to display it in ways that neurotypical people are. So he will do those types of classes, but he'll also have, like he has a job working at CVS nearby in New Rochelle, which is uh, in partnership with the school in CVS. So he'll go and he'll, for example, he checks all the expiration labels on the items there, but then he'll also work as a mail clerk in the nearby hospital. So he'll just work in the mail room sort so of. So are these, are these jobs that he gets paid for? He doesn't get paid for. He'll go for about an hour or two um, on the designated day. So I believe Mondays and Fridays are his current work schedule. So it's sort of like in place of a class. Okay. How did Liam respond to being the subject of your photo essay? And how did your parents respond to the fact that you were doing this? Right. I think that's sort of a privilege for photographing a sibling is, you know, you're very comfortable with each other. Like there's that established trust and a bond, I think, is what definitely has given me um, sort of an advantage to photographing my brother. Like, we already have this understanding because we are related. Uh, we've grown up together. So he, you know, sometimes I'll just have to say, like, he would look at the camera more so when I initially started the project, and I'm like, you know, don't, don't look at me. Like, you don't have to smile and pose for the photo. Like, I'm just photographing you as you are. Like, continue what you're doing. Like, pretend I'm not here in a sense. So there's also like kind of that difficult line of when to be, you know, a sister and when you're a photographer. Right. It's like, you know, once the camera's up like this, but then when you put it down, it's like constantly trying to marry those two roles together and make sure I'm not, you know, one or the other, but right. trying to maintain that balance. Um, for my, as for my parents, you know, I think it's, it was initially a little bit scary for them once the work started to go out there because it is such a relevant topic and I think that people really are interested in autism and sort of understanding it better and this is from a first person, well my photographs, but from Liam's perspective with his handwriting onto the images so I felt like there was a lot of interest in that and people just wanting to see it more and share it. Um, but I think as a parent you always have your child's best interest right. at heart and especially having a child who has a disability, it can be scary to put them out there. But right after seeing the impact that it had and you know how it's helped I mean I got like so many heartwarming messages from parents and siblings with autism all over the world and I showed that 
to my parents. So I think it just got to a point where everyone understood like this work, you know, not only helps us to better understand Liam, but it does help other families who have um, other family members with autism mm -hmm. understand them better as well. Barbara, CUNY makes a significant effort to accommodate students with various disabilities. I mean, I see them, I teach at Queens College, I see them on campus, I've had them in my classes. Uh, tell me about uh, the kinds of services that it offers to students with disabilities. Sure. CUNY has always been a school that has really been there to serve, say, the underserved, the marginalized, all students of all abilities. We have, at this point, over 10,000 students with disabilities. And when I say that, those are just the ones we know about because we believe there are many others with invisible disabilities who have not disclosed. So we have always worked with students to address any accommodations or needs they may have. I'm just going to go back a drop into history to how we got to the autism program. Uh, about 10 years ago, we felt that as disability directors, we were preparing our students academically. They were getting their degrees, but they weren't always getting out to work at the same rate as their counterparts without disabilities. So we created a program called CUNY Leads, which is linking employment, academics, and disability services to provide uh, career services to students in addition to what the campus career offices to work on some of the unique uh, issues that students with disabilities may have gaining, going towards employment to be sure they had internships and all of the things needed. Then what happened is we were able to get a grant. We found that our students on the autism spectrum had some other issues, and they were usually less academic. They were more social, um, just really sometimes the first place we'd find one of our students with autism who didn't disclose could be at a behavior, behavioral intervention team. Perhaps they were perceived as stalking somebody or had an inappropriate interaction. So we felt that we really needed to address our students, make sure that they had a fully inclusive and productive experience at the university. So through the FAR Fund, they gave us a generous grant and we created Project REACH. And that is based in five campuses but serves the university to be sure that our students have every opportunity that all other students do. We also work with employers because we feel we can prepare for student for employment, but at some point the employers also need to understand some of the unique social needs that a student has. We make sure their, um, you know, their clubs are accessible. We work on universal design, and I was gonna say your photo journal to me is the perfect universal design of learning. It gives anybody a sense, it puts a voice and a clear understanding, so you don't need a lecture to understand a little bit about Liam's existence and, and his feelings. So we have, um, we started our Project REACH grant. We knew about approximately 200 students on the spectrum. At this point, that was in 2012, now we have over 800 students that we know about that have um, self-disclosed as on the autistic okay. spectrum. Okay, all right. Um, how many, five campuses? Uh, Our pilot the, projects. Your pilot yes, project. We serve the whole university and we have a neurodiversity conference which is scheduled for March this year where we have a full day of autism um, programming and it's open to the community. Okay. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with Erin Lefebvre and Barbara Bookman after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with photographer Erin Lefebvre and CUNY's Barbara Bookman. Um, Barbara, what kinds of challenges do autistic college students grapple with in college? Okay, there's a variety of them, and again, you know, as it's often said, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So everybody has different challenges. Most commonly, we have students will come in with the baggage of, I was bullied in high school. Social skills, they're not comfortable. You know, sometimes people see someone who appears different and they shy away. Or they assume this person doesn't want to be friendly or doesn't want to interact. So um, we address some of these social issues with students. We work with faculty too on students need to understand, sometimes students are very concrete. 
Um, an example is a professor can walk in and say, mouth zipped, eyes closed, eyes open. Person will say, I don't have a zipper on my mouth. You know, they don't understand certain interactions. We need to be sure curriculums are very clear for students, not test every three weeks, but there will be a quiz on March 3rd, April 3rd, uh, exactly what is involved. We want to be sure all clubs and activities are wide open. There is a disability club on every campus where students can get together. So uh, we also have mentoring programs where students can be mentored on some of the campuses and we've had, um, especially on the College of Staten Island, it's all participatory research. The, the students who are on the spectrum, they will start out as mentors, mentees, and they can become mentors to other students. So someone who, is, who has a disability who is applying to CUNY um, and lets you know that they have a disability, then you, then you, do you start working with them to, to figure out uh, a support program for them? How does that work? Okay, nowhere on the application is the disclosure necessary. A student gets accepted based on their uh, academic you know, they, they've achieved their high school diploma, they are qualified to enter CUNY. At that point, they would have to disclose in order to receive services. Unlike the high schools where you reach out to students, it's, it's completely by law disclosure. So if the student comes to the disabilities or accessibility office and discloses, we will then sit down with them and figure out what accommodations make sense, what do you need, what is helpful, and they will be offered the opportunity to go to Project REACH, or in some cases we have something called Leads Plus, which is also enhanced services. We also have a neurodiversity job club for students, for job seekers. Okay. Erin, uh, you sort of hinted at this before, but I, my question is, what's been the public response to Liam's world? It's been overwhelmingly positive, which has been really heartwarming for me. Um, I had a lot of people contact me and just tell me how much the photo series resonated with them, whether they had an autistic child, uh, an autistic sibling. It's really just been overwhelmingly positive and it's been great to receive so much support. Has Leon become something of a celebrity and how has he responded to that? When he, he was actually away at camp when the New York Times ran the article, so he had no cell phone access, no internet access. Um, but I found out later on that actually his camp counselors saw the article and showed, uh, showed each other and showed it to him. So when he came back, he found out on Facebook because a bunch of people had tagged him in the article and congratulated him on the story. So his text message to me was, oh, what happened on Facebook while I was away? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, everyone has seen the photos I took of you and they love them. And he said, his response was, yay, I'm so happy to be a star. But he's very, very humble. Okay. Barbara, I would suspect that it is a moment of great elation for you, the people in your office, uh, when a student who's on the autism spectrum uh, gets his or her degree. It's wonderful when, I have to say, any student gets the That's degree and right. a student that has had additional challenges. It, it's excellent. Uh, one of the things I think is sometimes not always understood is that students on the spectrum, we often think of them as majoring in a certain area or a certain set of skills. Our students receive their degrees in every possible major, including the graduate schools and professional schools. So we are thrilled, but we are even more thrilled when we see our students go out to work and have a fully enriched life. Um, I do want to mention that one of our advisors is on the autism spectrum, and he is so able to address the students exactly. You know, he really gets it. He understands. He's been there and um, can work very closely. But yeah, it's a moment of elation. The answer is yes, when a student gets okay. their degree. Now, are you directly involved in trying to help them get employment after graduation? We do work with students, not just at graduation, but every step of the way. Because what we find is unless you've had sufficient internships and you've had that experiences, it's that much harder to enter the world of work. All right, right now, 35, approximately 35% 35 of people on the spectrum who graduated high school are attending college. The employment rate, last I heard, stands at about 15%. So that is something that is critical, but we are seeing, with the right preparation, we are seeing much greater outcomes.
for our students. Erin, your mother, in your photo essay, your mother comes off as, as a, a kind of hero in this whole thing. Um, I don't know if she um, worked before Liam was diagnosed. I mean, did she have to, I mean, did she pretty much devote most of her life to raising Liam? Or did she, as opposed to working, having a career? Right, my mother has always worked. She still worked even when Liam was being, uh, when he was initially diagnosed and as he's grown up, uh, both her and my stepfather, Liam's father, have worked really hard to get Liam into ever since he was, he was diagnosed when he was around three years old. So he's gone to special uh, needs kindergartens, like he's always attended special needs schools, after school programs, so both of them. It's a very also complex process, like they've had to hire lawyers to advocate to get him into these schools, finding out about the after school programs, uh, going to outreach programs for families who do have children on the spectrum, so both of them have put in a lot of really hard work to help get my brother to where he is, and a lot of people aren't aware that it is an entire process yeah. that happened. Are you concerned about um, what's going to become of Liam as he grows into adulthood, what kinds of social supports are going to be available um, for him. Uh, I gather that, I don't know if your parents did live in New York City or outside of the city? Yeah, they live in New York City. Okay. Uh, I gather that New York City has more group homes for artistic adults than many other cities, but what lies ahead for him? I, I imagine that would be a concern. Yes, I mean, that is always, I think, a concern for any I think just parents, whether or not their children have disabilities, it's always concerning, you know, like what is going to become of my child? What kind of adult are they going to grow into? But when you do have a sibling or child that does have some type of disability, that question is more so at the forefront of your mind. So right now, Liam is getting the support he needs. He has wonderful teachers, wonderful classmates, like parents that are always looking out for him. So he is where he needs to be, but that is always a pressing question in our mind. Um, so I think we're really just taking it one day at a time. Back in the 80s, uh, when I was covering education for the New York Daily News, I wrote a series about this, the New York City Public Schools special education program. Uh, at the time, uh, the special education program was complicated, dysfunctional, and frustrating. And uh, according to a recent article, I think it was in the Times, it still is. Um, so if you have a child with any disability um, who's in the public school system, what are the chances that that child is gonna have of getting his special needs met? Barbara, do you get any sense of that? Or Erin, do you? It's, it's a difficult challenge. I think basically every student with any kind of disability really needs a good advocate whether it be the family, whether it be someone from the school, it is still a problem that has not been fully resolved. There is no perfect solution, but I do think we are moving forward. Did Liam, was Liam in public schools early on and did he have to deal with, I don't know, trying to get services there? So it was Experience. more so um, getting him into the special needs schools so it's not like a lot of public schools do have a special needs program so Liam has always attended like schools that are special needs schools so he hasn't had that experience of being in a public school special needs programs but I know that is the reality for a lot of people who do have disabilities in New York City um, I am by no means an expert on that topic and I know there are a lot of hard-working teachers and advocates there who are trying to do the best for their students, but you know, school funding and right. lack of resources can obviously make that more challenging. Uh, we have about a minute left um, for you to answer this question. Um, to those who are watching this show, what message would you like to impart to them? I would like to say that autism is another way of people being neurodiverse. Uh, it's all part of the fabric of our unique differences and people on the spectrum have a range of skills, interests, and I think we just really need to embrace the neurodiversity. 
Right, I think empathy, understanding, uh, awareness, and compassion are just key values I think you should approach everyone with, uh, especially for people who are on the autism spectrum, and it's just a reminder, you know, not everything is what it, was it, not everything is what it seems, and you don't know what kind of obstacles and struggles people are facing behind closed doors, and it's just always be empathetic. and understand. Or what talents are lurking there beneath the surface. Exactly. I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank Erin Lefebvre and Barbara Bookman for joining me today. To see more of Liam's world, you can visit erinlefebvre.com. And for more information on Project REACH, you can visit cuny.edu. For One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.